Micah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth, for the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Baor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love, for the redeeming of our souls, for the salvation that you have brought to us through Jesus. Lord, we are humbled. And Father, I pray that our time in the Word would help us to walk humbly with you. Lord, I pray that it would move us to a place of doing what is good. God, we thank you for the way that you're working, for the way that we are growing and lives are changing and ministry is happening. And Lord, I pray this, this time that we spend together would be one more way that you mature and grow and build your church. Father, we want to align ourselves with you. We want to do our lives and our church in a way that is pleasing to you. And I ask, Lord, that as we open your word and unpack this together, that it would help us to be faithful to you, that it would help us to be pleasing to you. But Lord, I also pray that it would help us to make a difference for you in the lives of the people around us. And so we pray that this would be the work of your Holy Spirit, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 6-8 Sunday is about focusing our attention on what God wants and what our neighbors need. We saw here in Micah 6-8 as we read it where God tells them, Micah tells them, this is what God has said, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? This verse outlines what God wants. And so one of our goals today is that we would understand what God wants of us and that we would see how what God wants of us is also how God uses us in the lives of our neighbors. So a little quick background on this passage. Micah is a prophet. Micah has been asked basically like a lawyer to bring a case on behalf of the Lord to the people of Israel. It is Micah's responsibility to tell them on behalf of the Lord all that God has against them. He brings an indictment against them that begins even in verse 1 of chapter 1. It says that the word of the Lord came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. And he said, hear you peoples, all of you, pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountains will melt under him and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. And so Micah brings this indictment on behalf of the Lord to Israel. And in his bringing the message of the Lord to Israel, he points out their idolatry and that they're stealing 
property from others. There's a failure of civil leadership. There's a failure of religious leadership. There's a failure of the prophets. There are corrupt business practices. They are a violent people, and they are offering sacrifices to the Lord with hearts that are not truly repenting. And so in Micah chapter 6, God asked Israel a question. In verse 3, he says, Oh, my people, what have I done to you? You see, I, I think we're kind of prone as people to say, God, what did we do to you? You know, things aren't going the way that we want them. Things are hard. Life can be difficult. And we will ask the Lord, God, what have I done to deserve what is happening to me? But I don't think we often think about God asking us, but what has he done to deserve what we're doing to him? And that's what Micah brings to Israel. He says, how have I wearied you? Answer me. And then he tells them all that he had done for them. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I have redeemed you. You are my people. I have delivered you over and over and over again from the enemies that seek to devour you. And the people of Israel respond in verses 6 and 7 with, an, I think, of anticipated response. Well, okay, God, we've done all those bad things. What can we do to make up for all the things that we have done? In verse 6, when they say, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come with burnt offerings? Shall I, shall I bring all, should we just even give you our children? Like, is there any way that we can make up for what we've done? I mean, they're face to face. The indictment comes from the prophet. He brings the truth to them. And the people of God respond by saying, what can we do to make up for our sins? What can we do that will appease you and remove this guilt from us? As two things that help us, I think, here understand it and apply this even to our own lives. And the first one is this. When we see their response to the indictment that God brings to them is they thought they could buy God's favor and forgiveness. Like God brings an indictment upon them and in their weight of response, their response is, well, how much is enough? Even our oldest child? Lord, would that be enough? To make up for what we have done, they ignore what God has ever told them. They show how far from understanding what he wants of them that they have moved. For back in the days of Moses, who the Lord references here in Micah 6, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, it says in Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. Like even in their response, they, they don't go back to what God had told them before. Like God has already told Israel, this is what I want from you. This is the relationship I desire from you. This is what I have redeemed you to be a part of. And they don't respond with, oh, yes, Lord, we love you and we are sorry. We want to live for you. We want this to be true and real. Instead, they respond with, how much is enough? You see, they were willing to give God everything but what he was asking for. In the nation of Israel, that's a consistent issue for them. He's asking for their whole hearts. He's asking for all of their lives, their minds, their hearts, their souls. He's asking for them to wrap their lives around who he is and what he has said. And they are constantly moving in this tension towards the Lord where they begin to take things back for themselves and begin to do some things for themselves, but make sure they give God some of what he was asking for. And God has told his people from day one, I just want you, like I want all of you living for me. And their response to his judgment is, well, what if we give you these things? Would this be enough? In their response, they have not said they'll never worship idols again. In their response, they haven't said that they're going to be holy and righteous in their living. They haven't said they want to do what he wants. They've just said, God, is there something we can do that'll take your judgment and your anger away from us? 
I don't think we are different. This is a way in which God and his people go. We are prone like the Israelites to think that we too might could do some of what God wants. That maybe we don't have to do everything. Maybe we don't have to give him everything, but give him a little. Do a little. And in recent years, I find our wandering from what God wants and what he says to be ever present as you look around the landscape of American Christianity. You see it a lot as people become afraid of what's going to happen. There's all these reports and statistics about, well, this is how many people go to church and 10 years ago it was this many and now it's this many and it's less and churches are shrinking and gospel influence is, is lessening and we've got to do something about it. And as people are responding to those realities, they are doing things that demonstrate that for maybe a while we've been just doing what we wanted to do for the Lord because what's happening in churches, even in our own community, are some are just saying, well, let's do more of what we like. And you begin to see that we're maybe not ready or willing to give God everything. And there's some indictments on our country and on churches. And we see the focus of so many church attenders and so many churches is just simply on ourselves, which is the position of the Israelites even in their response. We see it when we begin to build strategies as we hear the statistics, churches are shrinking, so we need to have churches that are growing. And the next thing you know, you have churches that are offering big screen TVs as giveaways on Sunday mornings or come take pictures with Disney princesses or movie characters as a reason and a motivation to be there. And you begin to see that the focus is on what people want or what people like. And we'll do five or six different versions of worship services so that you can have it exactly the way that you want it so that you can go home and talk about church as if it was like a restaurant experience or a movie event where we go home and talk about how well it was done or how much we liked it. Or is that even something I would want to go be a part of again? We see those things in the American church because in many ways, like the American church, we are about ourselves in the way that we think about our relationships with the Lord. But God is the goal of worship. And God is the goal of our lives. And Micah 6, 8 hits right every time. At a time in which we might need to ask ourselves, what should we be focused on? What should we be doing to make sure we give Harrisburg the best chance for a future? At the risk of young people not liking me anymore. I said in the first service that Micah 6 8 is just straight fire. <clears throat> It's all W's and no L's. It's a hundred. No cap. And just so y'all know, that's what y'all sound like when you talk like that. And if you don't know what I just said, none of it was bad. You're just old. So good. 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 Yes. Micah 6, 8. He has told you. Do you see what happens here? Lord, we're not where you want us to be. We're not doing this the way you have called us to do. So if we go do these things, would that work? And he responds, listen, the prophet says, guys, he has already told you. Why are you asking him if these things would be enough when he has already said it? Do justice. Love, kindness, your translation may say mercy. That's what I grew up saying. So I like mercy and to walk humbly with your God. One of the first things that 6, 8 Sunday, I hope, does for us is simply this, that we see here in Micah 6, 8, that as we think about what God wants from a church, first, God wants real worshipers. That that's actually what God is aiming for. J.M. Boyce, in writing about this moment, says that God here answers quietly, that he is not asking for anything new. He's not laying down further religious ordinances. All he asks is what has been asked from the beginning. 
not a ritual or a routine, but a reality to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. That God wants real worshipers. That's what he wants. He wants this to just simply be real. Not performative, not going through the motions, not something we could sit down at lunch and say, well, I think ours is better than the one down the road, and I think what we're doing is better than what they're doing over here. But to say, listen, we, we're here for God. We've come to truly worship him together and with our lives, and real worshipers love their Redeemer with all of their heart. All of their heart. God has never asked for less than all of you. He's always wanted all of you. Even when sitting with a woman, Jesus was talking to her in Samaria, and she's like, hey, listen, the, the people in Jerusalem say that that's the place to worship, but our ancestors say that this well that Jacob dug is the place to worship. So as a prophet of the Lord, what do you say? And she said, hey, you got it all wrong. There's a day coming where all we want is people who will worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. That it's not about where, it's about here. And are we worshiping him with our whole hearts? Micah, at the end of this book, in chapter 7, verse 18, says, Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. It is the love and the forgiveness of God that is even in the indictment. God sends Micah to a people he loves to point out where they are wrong in their relationship with him and then says, and I'm going to bring you back in. He wants real worshipers. Jesus is a shepherd king that is spoken of even in the book of Micah. In Micah chapter 5, it says, He shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. That even in the book of Micah, God is portrayed as this shepherd who brings his people in and who loves them and cares for them, and Jesus is that shepherd king who has brought us in, and in doing so has said, listen, this is what I ask of you, that you would leave yourself and the world behind and that you would love me your Redeemer, with all of your heart. And so because God wants a people who love him, he then tells them, what I want for you is to then do what people who love me do. Because real worshipers demonstrate their love and their faith in God. Walter Kaiser, in writing about the, this moment in Micah, says it is simply a natural consequence that truly forgiven men and women demonstrate the reality of their faith by living it out in the marketplace. Such living would be accompanied with acts and deeds of mercy, justice, and giving of oneself, that this is the natural consequence of people who've been redeemed. This is the natural consequence when God comes to Abram in the Old Testament. Abram lives in a place called Ur in the land of the Chaldeans, and it was wealthy. It was amazing. You would have been wowed even today. You can go, uh, like Mike and them, I don't know if y'all went to the British Museum or not, but you can go to the British Museum, uh, and you can see all of these artifacts from the same time period as Abram. When he was called out from Ur, technologically superior, wealthy, comfortable. And God goes to Abram and says, hey, listen, I want you to follow me and I'm going to show you a land when we get there. Now, Abram would not be in the Bible as a father of many nations if he had said, hey, I believe you, but I'm not going anywhere. I believe you can do that. And I believe you will do that, but I'm going to stay right here with all of this gold overlaid coffee table these incredibly cushy couches, purified water, buildings built so that the breezes cool off the homes. I'm going to stay here. He wouldn't be someone that we would say had faith because it was his believing that led to his leaving Ur and moving off into the wilderness to go where it was that God was going to show him. The same thing is true 
at every turn with everyone in Scripture that the Bible says has faith. Their faith is demonstrated in how they live their lives and in what they do. James chapter 2 says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works, and show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You see, real worshipers demonstrate their love for the Lord and their faith in God in their lives. And in particular, in their relationships with God and with one another, which leads me to this second piece is that real worship is not about you. It's not about you. When he says that we need to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly, it's because worship's not about you. It is a weird question to ask. Did you like worship today? The only person who can actually answer that question is the person who is being worshiped. So God, did you like what we did today? Like you may not always like the beat of a song or the speed of a song or even know the song. And I can't help but think to myself when we're singing in worship is that God is here and he's listening and he's watching and I don't want to be on the other side of him going, mm -mm, not, for, not today, not for you, Lord. I'll sing any song but that one for you. And so I find myself influenced by some of the writers of the Reformation and even Martin Luther who would write about our singing that there really is an audience to our singing and it is not you and it is not me, it is the Lord and we sing to him because worship's not about us. And we say so many things in today's modern church about ourselves and about what we think and how we think everything should be and God's people thought so highly of themselves that God said, hey, you've done all of this and you're not where I want you to be and they were like, well, um, okay, hang on, hang on, just a second, God. Is this enough? Is this enough? If you don't know what that is, by the way, that's a tape. Credit card looks like a tape. Every time I use it, people don't know what a tape is. Well, what if I use all of them, Lord? Is that, is that enough? We don't always think about ourselves as being selfish. But we... And our own hearts and minds can be just as selfish in our worship, just as selfish in our relationship with the Lord. And there's no way to see the call of God where he says, listen, I've already told you what to do. I've already told you what I require of you. And it's never a, was this enough, Lord? It's just the recognition that it's not about us. Because you see, doing justice equals loving your neighbor more than yourself. That's what doing justice means. If you see someone who is in a situation where the thing happening to them is not right, then you're moving in your life. You have a choice to make. Do I intercede? Do I intervene? Do I offer help? I've got everything I need. Is it fair that I've taken care of my family and I've been doing what's good for my family and, and they need something? Is it right for me to have to give of mine to then do for them? Jesus was being asked some pretty pointed questions by a bunch of lawyers. And in his relationship with them in that moment, he said, well, let me tell you a story about the law. And he tells a story about a man who was walking down a road that he came upon thieves and they beat him almost to death, took everything of value from him and left him on the side of the road to die. And, and according to Jewish law, if he's dead, touching him is a massive list of rituals you have to go and perform to be clean. You can't go back in your home if you're unclean. You would make your family unclean. You can't go to the temple and worship the Lord there because you are unclean. And so touching someone that's dead is just absolute no-no. But someone who's bleeding out is also a no-no. And there's even some things they would have to do ritually. Like had they gone, if someone had gone to help this man laying on the side of the road who's bleeding out and dying, they can't immediately go home. 
They can't go hug their wife and have dinner with their children. They can't go to the temple and offer sacrifices because they would now be unclean. And Jesus had been asked, who's my neighbor? He says, well, it's like this man that got beat up, all of his stuff stolen. He's now unclean. He's laying, dying in the dirt. And a priest comes by on his way to do his job in the temple. And he sees that man and recognizes that man and then has to make a decision. If I go touch that man, I can't go do what I had planned to do for the Lord today. I I can't go to temple. I can't go be around my family. If I go help that man, then I am unclean. And so he passes by. Then another one of the religious leaders who also works at the temple comes by and sees that same man on the side of the road and has that same exchange in his mind. If I touch him and help him, I'm going to be unclean and I'm clean and I'm right and I'm going to stay clean and I'm going to stay right. And that means that man may die. He also goes around on the other side of the road and avoids the man laying and dying in the dirt. And then in Jesus' story, he says, but then another man came by. This man was a Samaritan. And the Samaritans, according to the law and the Jews, are an unclean people. Their entire race is unclean. And so this unclean man in Jesus' story sees a man who's also unclean. And that unclean man goes over and helps to nurture and to take care of the wounds of the other unclean man. And then after getting him bandaged up and able to ride, puts him on his donkey and takes him to a hotel where an innkeeper who was willing to be responsible for his well-being takes money from this unclean man so that this unclean man can continue to recover. And in doing so, he says, listen, if it costs more than what I've given you today, when I come back through, I'll pay for whatever else it cost. And to a group of people who were very clean, having had two of the people of their world represented in the story that stayed clean, Jesus says, hey, which of these men was a neighbor? And they had to say the unclean man was a neighbor. Because doing good and doing justice and loving our neighbors more than ourselves is always costly. It's always costly. And doing justice means to love your neighbor more than yourself. Your example is Jesus, who was clean, who came into a world of unclean people and died the death of an unclean man, was buried in an unclean man's grave, and was resurrected so that unclean people could be clean. But also it's loving kindness is showing and growing in mercy. Like, that's what it means. If we're going to love kindness, we're going to love mercy, then we're not just going to love receiving it, we're going to love giving it. And who can give mercy the best? The people who have received the most. Of all people, the Israelites knew what it was to receive mercy. And in our world, under a new covenant in Christ, there is no one in this world who understands mercy better than a follower of Christ, because you are only in the kingdom according to the mercy of God. He has shown you mercy, and so you are to be a people who show mercy. And then also we are then to walk humbly. And that equals living with and for God in the ways that he wants you to. He has ways that he would have us to live. And humility, according to many people, describe humility as just simply what follows the Lord. One guy even says it follows the Lord like a shadow. You cannot walk as a sinner in a relationship with a righteous and holy God and not be humble. It is impossible to be prideful and to walk closely with the Lord. And humility grows and humility is expressed in our posture and our surrender and in our obedience. And on 6 8 Sunday, of a day to remind ourselves what the Lord wants. That He wants us as His people to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with Him. There's a push this morning that we would do so in relationship to our neighbors. For you cannot do justice, you cannot love kindness and mercy, or walk humbly with the Lord without a relationship with other people. 
when we do our Discover Harrisburg class here, as people come in to find out more about our church, one of the things that we tell them is that church is the place where we do and practice the one another's. There's all these one another's in the Bible. We are to love one another, to pray for one another, to bear with one another, to serve one another. We are even to stir up one another. And the stirring up of one another that's in the Bible is not the stirring up over politics or even if you did some shaming of one another over your SEC wins and losses maybe earlier today. It's not that kind of stirring up. It is a stirring up to what is called love and good works. These are our one another's. And without one another, we can't do what God requires of us. In fact, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it this way, that the church is the church when it exists for others. That a church can't be the church when we're doing this for ourselves. We can't do this selfishly motivated. If we were to have a gathering of Harrisburg, and if everybody was to come in thinking, I am focused on myself, and here's how that might look. You walk in the door and you pay attention to who says hello to you and to who doesn't. You walk in the door and think, who made a seat for me? Who paid attention to me? Who acknowledged my presence? I've been here now for two hours and that person's had five people say something to me. I've only had three people say something to me. I don't know about this. We often don't view those types of mindsets as self-focused, but they are. One of the things that Bonhoeffer writes about in his book, Life Together, about how we do this as believers is that we exist as a church when we are here for others. That the entire Christian life is about someone other than you. It is about the Lord and it is about the other people. It's just not about you. It is for others. One of my heroes in ministry is Charles Spurgeon. And maybe 15 years ago at a pastor's conference, I heard a gentleman talking about Spurgeon and his church by the name of Metropolitan Tabernacle there in London. He was pastor there in the 1860s. And in talking about the church, I remember thinking to myself, I don't know that I've ever heard church quite described that way. But something inside of me felt like that's how church probably should be. For most of my life, people have said, hey, we're as a pastor, people just ask you questions. What's your vision for the church? Where do you think our church should go? And I come back to Micah 6, 8 a lot for the answer to that question. Charles Spurgeon, in writing about the church, said this, The churches are not made that men of ready speech may stand up on Sundays and talk, and so win daily bread from their admirers. No, there is another end and aim for this. These places of worship are not built that you may sit comfortably and hear something that shall make you pass away your Sundays with pleasure. A church which does not exist to do good in the slums and dens and kennels of the city is a church that has no reason to justify its longer existing. A church that does not exist to reclaim heathenism, to fight with evil, to destroy error, to put down falsehood. A church that does not exist to take the side of the poor, to denounce injustice, and to hold up righteousness is a church that has no right to be. Not for yourself, O church, do you exist any more than Christ existed for himself. His glory was that he laid aside his glory. And the glory of the church is when she lays aside her respectability and her dignity and counts it to be her glory to gather together the outcast and her highest honor to seek amid the foulest mire the priceless jewels for which Jesus shed his blood. To rescue souls from hell and lead to God, to hope, to heaven. This is her heavenly occupation. Oh, that the church would always feel this. Thinking about the church and our future, and where we should focus our time and our attention. There's a great temptation to focus on being Christians and churches and experiences that the people around us would be excited to be a part of. The people of Israel had the mindset that, well, here's what we think, but God has said, this is what I require. The goal of our message today is that you would think and focus on being a church that exists for the Lord. To think about how our church can, for the Lord, be for our neighbors. How can we do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with the Lord? And in very brief fashion, because we will unpack these more this evening, three ways to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. The first is this, to simply give sacrificially. 
This last October, we started promoting what we call the Acts 1-8 offering. We have tied together all of our special offerings throughout the year into one big pot and percentage-wise, how that will go out. Information about that is in your bulletin. It's in our newsletter. We're promoting that on a regular basis. And today we want to put that in front of you and say that when you give to the Acts 1-8 offering, one of the places that that will go is to a fund for families who adopt children in our church. That there's many reasons that adoption costs what it costs, and you can dislike it all you want, but it is true. And there's a lot that goes into it. And so for families that feel that call from the Lord to move in that direction, we have a fund here at Harrisburg. And when God moves them in that direction, they can let us know and we can help them on the front end to keep moving in the Lord's direction. And so when you give to the Acts 1-8 offering, you help populate that fund so that families can move in that kind of direction. But there's also regular giving, giving sacrificially to the work of the church. And I told the 830 service this, and I'm going to try to say it about the same way. If you are a part of what God is doing, and if you are benefiting from the ministries of this church, then you should be contributing to the work of the church. That it would be confusing to those who are giving so that what we experience and are a part of here it would be confusing to them for someone to benefit from that, to participate in all of that and receive from all of that, but not be also helping to promote and grow those ministries. And so giving sacrificially towards the Lord's work, it happens both with things like the Acts 1-8 offering, happens even our regular giving on a weekly basis. But we also, if we want to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with the Lord, we also grow in your faith. There are many churches and people attending churches who are growing in their knowledge, but not moving in any way in faith. And from a pastor's perspective, we do a lot of time with the people who are receiving. And my encouragement to you would be, if you're sitting in multiple Bible studies a week, listening to sermons on Sundays and maybe podcasts and other things during the week, if you are intaking so much teaching on the Bible, then in your life, start moving outward with trusting God with some act of obedience and dependence on Him in your relationship with other people. The growing in your knowledge is not the same thing as growing in your faith. That growing in your faith is learning to do like Abraham did when God says, hey, listen, if you believe me, then you'll come with me and I'll tell you when we get there. Okay. I do believe you or to be like David who had been anointed king and had another king, the king sitting above him at the reigning king, trying to hunt him down and kill him. And on multiple occasions, David had the opportunity to take his life to kill the man who was trying to kill him and assume the throne that he had already been ordained for. And David took a step back every time and said, I trust the Lord with that timing. I will be king when the Lord is ready for me to be king. And so growing in your faith is not the same thing as growing in your knowledge. Growing in your faith is when that knowledge moves itself to action, when belief moves itself to dependence. And then the third way would be to just simply do good. Tonight at five o'clock, we'll have a dinner. And listen, it's pulled pork barbecue and none of us need to eat as much of that as we want. And so if you haven't signed up and you show up tonight at five o'clock, we're going to trust the Lord that whatever little bit we may get will be enough. We'll have a meal and then we're going to break out and we're going to have sessions where you can listen to people talk about foster care and what that experience has been like for them and how you as a church member can be involved in foster care ministry because it's more than those who bring children into their homes. We want to have partners and people praying and people supporting and encouraging. Not only that, there'll be a breakout session on adoption where you can find out one, maybe how you could move in that kind of direction, but also how you can help make that happen here in our church. CASA of North Mississippi is an incredible thing here in our community. Children all over our county need someone in the court system who is there for their good. Because in the midst of some of the broken situations that children are involved in, none of the adults are often worried about the children. That's often one of the most significant problems in that situation. And so we'll have people from CASA, church members who run that work here in our city, here to talk and to share how you can be an advocate for children who need someone in the process who's there for them. We have a cancer care ministry in the women's ministry of our church. We're hoping after today to be starting a cancer care ministry towards men. 
and that ministry would move itself not just through our congregation, but to the needs of others. You heard Clay mention earlier in our service about our food drive that'll happen on November 23rd. There's lots of ways to be a part of that, that you could even help us do that ministry before the day of the 5-2 ministry. There are children all over Tupelo and Lee County who benefit from the 5-2 ministry of our church. You may not always have this in view, but there are children who go home from school every Friday and they don't know where their next meal will come from until Monday morning for the free school breakfast. And so our church, along with other organizations in town, has taken up that responsibility. And so for two different elementary schools every week, there are kids who go home with a bag of food that those children can prepare and eat themselves from Friday afternoon until Monday morning. Those bags are packed here paid for by Harrisburg and are delivered by members of Harrisburg. And we'll be talking about how you could be a part of that ministry even tonight at our time together. But not only that, but the Parkgate Pregnancy Clinic and our one-by-one mentoring, it's difficult to think about doing justice without working for the unborn. If you want to find out more, we'll be talking about that tonight. There's a recovery and hope ministry that is in the process of launching. We have members of our church who are very familiar with the difficulties of addictions and grief in different forms, who've been meeting and praying about how we as a church can be a place where the gospel is available, but where relationships are also available to people in difficult situations who need it. They'll be talking about that ministry tonight. So part of your application would be to come back tonight at five o'clock or to join in in this in the near future, but My questions for you as we close, the first is this, is will you join me in praying that we will be the church that God desires and the church that our neighbors need? You see, there's a choice that churches in our country are having to make right now. Do we want to be a church that other church people just want to come to? Or do you want to be a church that says there are people out there who need Jesus and people with real broken lives that need to hear the gospel? And let's be that one. Because what we have found at this point in our country is you really can't focus on yourselves and focus on other people. You got to make a choice. So I'm asking if you would to pray that we would continue moving in that direction to be the church that God desires and a church that our neighbors need. And then on an individual level, would you commit to being the Christian God desires and that your family and your neighbors need? (laughs) For when God holds up the mirror of your sin through his word, There is a temptation in all of us to say, well, what can I do to make up for that? And Micah 6, 8 says nothing. You can't. But what does the Lord require of you? That from this point forward, that you would do justice, that you would love mercy, and that you would walk humbly with your God. And for many of us, we just need this reminder today to move in a humble direction with the Lord. And to be others focused, starting at home and rippling itself out into the lives of the people around us and making sure that we're not putting ourselves at the center of our lives or even our church. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your word, for the way that there are days and moments where it seems to challenge us more abruptly, sometimes even more particularly in our hearts and our minds. And so, God, I pray that we would hear what you have said and that we would do what you require. So, Lord, whatever we need to do in our minds and our hearts to get to the place where we are living for you and for the needs of others, we pray, Lord, that you would do that. And, God, we pray that we would be a church like those Metropolitan Tabernacle Days in London where the city would begin to pray for us in hopes that we would never fail because of all the ways the Lord is using us here in their lives. So Father, we pray that as you have become what we depend on, that Lord, you would then move us to be a church that our city can count on, to love them, to care for them, to minister to them, to fight for them, and more than anything, Lord, to share the gospel with them. So we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.